record. Okay, I got it recording. The recording will start now. Thank you, Melissa. Any other questions? Okay, Let's see. We've done our welcome. We did a Canvas kind of walkthrough. Okay, back to Canvas. Okay, so that's what these icons, the hexagon icons are here, the links to those other things. So next thing down from home is syllabus. So here are all of our deadlines, but we're going to look at it in the syllabus. And lots of things open here. Okay. Here's our syllabus. All right. Please stop me when you have questions. Okay. Just unmute, jump on in. Because if you're thinking it, somebody else is too. So a lot of this was on the page, the website we just looked at. Okay, so materials, there's that Barry Cohen's textbook, the fourth edition, we saw how we could get it online. The ebook encyclopedia, I just showed you how you can find that. We are definitely using Canvas, check it often, I'll send messages every day. R, our studio, and some kind of tech software, it depends on if you're Mac or PC, which one. We'll be doing the download after this, how to download and install those on your software. There will be a point in one of the chapters we'll need another piece of software called G Power. All of these softwares are free. And free is nice, but what's more important is, is that they're freely available, which means you can download and install them on any computer you have, anywhere you are. Um, the big kicker with SPSS is it's expensive and you have licenses and it takes a long time to install and every 12 months the license is up and if your license is out of date, you cannot open your files. And this was a big problem. Graduate students would do like their grad work and then they would submit it to be published and then you'd get a revise and resubmit back from the um, journal and you can't even open your file to do any editing or changing if you don't have SPSS on your machine. Um, at the university, um, they have the Citrix receiver that you can use SPSS with, but I will tell you, I tried using it to teach this class for three years, and it was so clunky. We had so many problems with it. That's why we abandoned it. So G Power is another little piece of software. There's the link here on the syllabus. We will go there in a future, I think it's chapter six, if I had to say it off the top of my head. We will, I'll show you how to do that. It's, these will make your life easier to use these softwares. You will also need some kind of calculator. And the calculator does not need to be a $100 graphing calculator that you need for your kids in high school. This, you, you just need a calculator that can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and have square root key. That's good enough. So a $5 calculator usually does it. Um, you cannot use your phone or the computer for the, your calculator when you're taking the test. So you need some kind of inexpensive calculator that at least has a square root button. That's as fancy as it needs to be. And a laptop, here I have this from other semesters. It's nice to bring to class. Obviously, we're not coming to class. And looks like everyone has a computer, so that's great. Okay, grade components. Here are the parts of your grade. Number one, Canvas discussions. So almost everyone, at least that was allowed because of Canvas, has already done your introduction. Thank you very much. That helped me get to know you guys and what departments you're coming from and a little bit of background. We will have discussions that are due for every chapter. And the discussion is point that you need to post is about each chapter. So you have to read the material of the chapter before you come to class and post something about it. That can be a summary about it, um, something that interested you about the chapter, um, some way you can see applying it, and then you need to respond or reply to at least one other student's point. And that's what's required for the discussion. So some of you guys are more education majors than I am, but I know from education that the first exposure does not solidify an idea. That when you're learning something new, a lot of times this material at this speed especially feels like a fire hose to the face and you're trying to drink out of it and it's going everywhere and you're like lucky to catch anything. So I function with a five exposure kind of methodology. I think that you need five exposures to really absorb this material. So I want you to read the chapter, 
and think, digest it to write your discussion post. Then we have lecture, homework, and exam. Five chances to absorb this material in a little bit more depth. For some of you reading the chapter, you're going to be like, oh yeah, I already knew most of the stuff. I'm just filling in some little gaps that I didn't learn much. Others of you are going to read the chapter be like, what language was that in again? And so the five exposures are to give you five chances to read, digest, and post, listen to a lecture, work through some example problems, and then the summative assessment in the exam to really get that material digested and into your brain to where you can really know what's going on. So I used to have students do, write a summary, like a page long APA format summary for every chapter. Um, Tyson kind of tried out doing this discussion point and had some really good um, discussions with his students and found out found that he thought that it was a really good method. So I'm going to try it this semester. Um, I've used it to, on some level in other classes, but I'm really excited about the discussion boards. Um, so if you have questions about the material, if it's one of those chapters you're like, uh, English, really? I didn't think so. Um, put that in your summary. Put what was clear and what was not clear, what you want to go over some more. Um, you know, every person's going to have a different experience with the material. And it's not easy or hard based on the material. It's easy or hard a lot based on your prior experience with the material. And so the first chapter we're doing, second chapter, what type of variable it is. How do you do the average? How do you do standard deviation? Those might feel pretty easy to some of you. I still want you to go through the process of reading the chapters and doing a discussion point. There will be other chapters like the one on multiple comparison. Barry Cohen in this textbook goes at, he just loves multiple comparisons and he takes like 20 pages to go over all these different methods and oh my gosh, it's boring as heck to me. <laughs> so we'll deal with it. Okay, so there's the discussion point posts. Those need to be done by 10.30 a.m. on the day we're gonna cover the material in class to make sure you've already had a prior exposure but at least one or two levels before we have the lecture. The lowest two will be dropped. Yes, Melissa. Sorry. No, go for it. So do you want a summary of the chapters and like a question point or a discussion point or just a discussion point or exactly what are you looking for in that? Any of the above. It does not have to be all. You don't have to do a summary and a question and a use. You don't need to do all three. Um, in here it uses the word or and in um, mathematical terms we or means an and or. So you can do all three of them or you can just do two of them or you can do one of them. That meets the criteria of the or word. So you can summarize it or ask a question. Now it shouldn't be, I didn't get any of it. That's not, you know, not a cop out, but you know, some kind of digestion of the chapter. And sometimes it's gonna be easier to write these than others. And um, this is for you more than it is for me. So I don't wanna assign any busy work to anyone. So this, is, this, this serves two purposes. The main purpose is that it makes you think about this material before you come to class. The second is so that I can give you a score on that because we're all busy. Nobody in here is stupid, but some of us are stupid busy, especially with the kids out of school and everything else that's going on right now and the speed of this class. So it's kind of to keep us all moving forward and not getting behind, because this is like a snowball rolling forward. You don't want to like get behind. So part of it is just to be able to score it to keep everyone up, but really this is more, that's the only thing I care about is that it makes you read the chapter and think about it before you come to class and I need to give you a score so it keeps us all honestly doing that and not getting behind. Um, yeah, so in the responding, try to make it a meaningful response to somebody else's. Now, if you're going to respond to someone else, if everyone waits to post these at 1025, it's going to be really hard to respond. So if you can try to do these a little bit before the deadline, you could do every chapter today. I mean, nobody has that time, but you don't need to wait to the last minute to do these. You can work ahead on these if you have an extra bit of time. Everyone has a different schedule, but you know, they're all open. You can get going on those whenever you have time to read in the textbook and kind of summarize those. The homework 
there's homework is turned in by chapter. So there are 20 chapters in these book, this book. We're skipping two chapters, so there's 18 chapters. There's actually 19 assignments because, uh, well, I think there might be 18 after all because we merged the last two. There's like 18 or 19 homeworks. Um, these used to be done on paper, and I had some skeletons that for showing your work and putting your answer. We are now moving this past year to having these filled out on Canvas. Question, Sam? No, okay. Um, the benefit of having these filled out on Canvas is we have this new module in Canvas called Atomic Assessment. If you haven't heard of it, it is really nice because it lets you get, give different kind of questions on a homework, not just a multiple choice in an essay box. And you can let students check their answer on each problem up to X number of times. So I have set it so you can check your answer on each problem up to three times. So this gives you an opportunity to get immediate feedback on the homework without waiting until you come to class or send an email or a discussion point. So it's fabulous. That's the great side. The downside is, is I only have chapter 11 forward put into atomic assessment so far. So I'm gonna be like rushing ahead of you to put these in atomic assessment. And if you wanna work ahead, let me just show you what you can do for the assignments. Now these assignments, I have made the deadline basically midnight each night. And that way, so you can come to class and ask questions when you have time after class to finish them up before they're due. So if I come to Canvas, no, the website. So here's the website, about 6,600 on my web, my website. So if you kept scrolling down, here are all the chapters that are in the book. And for each chapter, you'll notice there's a, uh, either an HTML or a PowerPoint slideshow with a mix of those two formats. And then there's the R skeleton and then the worksheets that go with the homework. These are the old worksheets I used to have my students do. So these, all of the homeworks currently are in the textbook. So this is chapter one, section A, problem number one, A through F. These are exactly out of the textbook. I haven't changed any of them yet. That's like next year's project. But this says, give two examples of each of the following, a nominal scale, an ordinal scale, an interval scale. These are the things that are talked about in the textbook. So if you want to work ahead, you could, you could pr print out these PDFs and work on them to get ahead. But tonight, hopefully, I'll have this one up in atomic assessment so you can just skip the worksheet and just go right to atomic assessment to fill those out. All the assignments um, that are in atomic assessment, I believe, are open. So let me, let me skip down. I want to show you one of them. So here's homework 16. Yep. So this is what it'll look like. Give it a second. It's, it's really slick. I'm so excited. I've been working with Neil Legler over in the CIDI department. So it gives you little places where you type in based on the output and then there's this check your answer button. And you click it and it will highlight them in red or green or yellow based on if they're correct or incorrect. Anyway, so and then you can click down the assignment to the different problems in the assignment. And then when you're done, you get to the end, you turn it in. And the last thing is always to upload the R file, but I don't want to get ahead of myself too much. It's like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Okay. Where were we? Canvas? Oh, we were on the syllabus. That was the homework. Okay. Questions on the homework? Um, Dr. Schwartz, you yeah. have these all due the day of the exam. Is that yeah. still? Okay, perfect. Just double checking. Yeah, usually I have these chapter assignments due on different days, but since we're going so fast here, I have just for simplicity made all the homeworks due on the day of the exam. The last thing on the syllabus is the schedule and we'll click to there. The due dates are also in Canvas um, to check on there. I am totally okay if you work with other people in class. I mean, social distancing in place and all that. You know, if you want to Zoom or phone call or whatever you do with other people in the class, that's fabulous to work with them. The homework is, you know, use it to help yourself learn. Don't use it for me. The homework is for you. The exams are to show me what you know. 
the homeworks are for you to work through the process of learning what we're doing. Um, use the discussion boards. Um, email me. We hopefully will be able to use a lot of class time to go over the questions you have about the homework. They're, they're a work in progress type thing. They're not a quiz. The exams are the quizzes. And I've titled them exams, but I, they're more like a quiz. The exams, of which there are six, are going to be given through Proctorio. Has anyone here used Proctorio? A few, not everyone. Proctorio means you can take the quiz on Canvas wherever you are. You do need a good internet connection. So when we're ready to take exam one, you come in here, you click on exam one, and oh, it's, it's locked right now. But when you click on to take the test, it has you like, it scans your, you have to use the, the webcam on your computer and it ha you have to give it permission to use the webcam to record your screen of your computer and the mic of your computer and you need to be alone in the room so there's not all that interface and you have to show it a, a photo ID, either a school ID or a driver's license or something and it takes a picture of it to make sure it's you. And um, so it records those things while you're taking it. Now, the exams, I mean to be more of a quiz difficulty quiz time amount, you are going to have two hours. Whenever you take the exam, once you start, you have two hours to finish. But it should only take you a half hour-ish to 45 minutes to take it. That's why, I, but I give you a two hour block of time so you don't have to feel rushed. Um, and, you, and you'll have a t at, least a, at least a two day window in which you can choose the best time for you to take the exam. So you'll have two days during which you can take the exam anytime you want to take it, but once you start it, it's going to be turned in two hours later, whether you're ready or not. So make sure you have the time set aside. I do not anticipate it will take two full hours to take, but that will be available to you. And again, I'm not going to ever ask you to write computer code or use a computer program on a quiz or in a, the exams. I will give you the output and ask you to interpret it. Other than that, the exams should look like the homework. The homework should prepare you to do the exams. Questions about any of the stuff you get a grade for? Melissa, yeah. <laughs> I just had one question. Reading through this, it said you can use any of your notes or anything. Um, is it okay? I mean, I take my notes in my book. Is it okay to use that? Yes. So anything you have paper copies of, notes, homework, um, written examples, the actual textbook, all of that is open. Electronic things are not available to you during the exam. So if you've taken, typed in your notes, you'll want to print them out. The homework assignments are done in, can in, the, in Canvas electronically. You can't open those up. But you can print out the assignment after at the end when you're done with an assignment and submit it, you can print it out. So anything you have a printout of is fine, but you cannot open another website, insert Google something. You cannot use the calculator on the computer. That's why you need to have a little standalone, not a phone, not an iPad, but just a little calculator because you can't use anything electronic in the computer other than when you open the exam, that's all you get to, your computer can, that's all it can show you until you turn the exam in. Good question. But yeah, they're basically open book, open notes. I don't want to test anyone on memorization. I am dyslexic. Memorization is awful for me. I don't have my times tables memorized yet. PhD in mathematics don't have them memorized because memorizing is very, very hard for me. And the thing is with statistics, you nobody memorizes this stuff it's okay to look things up but there is a limitation that has to be paper copies because if i opened it up to the internet nobody would study and everyone would run out of time so that's the reason for the only paper copies and somewhat of a time restraint so that we do study beforehand again because we're all just so busy we would push it off okay last note on here 
is there is not a comprehensive final. The exams are not comprehensive on purpose. However, like everything in math statistics, everything snowballs. And if you don't understand something in chapter one or two, it's gonna come back up in chapters four, five, and 14 and 17. So if you don't understand something, let's figure it out because it will come back over and over and over again. These themes continue on. I don't make it comprehensive on purpose. It's just comprehensive a little bit by nature. The next thing I have here is the grading scheme. It's just the basic one. Um, students tend to, that show up and do the work tend to do very, very well in this class historically. I have a high percentage of A's in this class and I'm okay with that. Um, a lot of the discussion points, if you do them, it's full credit. You know, the homework, you can check your answers. So probably gonna get really high scores there. So even if you bomb the exams, you can do really well in this class. Again, you're taking this class because you need to know this material, not because, you know, I don't wanna make it busy work. Um, attendance, this is full speed ahead class. Um, by the average, you should be spending 18 hours outside of class every week. There's a lot of material to cover and I will do my best to help it be as digestible as possible, but th taking this class for seven weeks is like a part-time job at least. Okay. Um, so if for any reason you're gonna miss class because something's conflicting, please let me know ahead of time. I will be recording and posting so you can watch it. Um, that's the good news, but still, if you're gonna miss more than one class, we need to talk because that's gonna be really hard to stay on the ball missing a whole week when we only have seven. But I get that everyone has more than this going on in their life. And if something comes up in your life, let me know as soon as possible especially for an exam beforehand, and we will work around it, you know. Um, the rest of this is mostly, you know, you guys can read it. It's just the legalities, the basic stuff, until we get to free advice. Um, the last little thing on here I wanna bring out, this always is an issue. I don't know what it is about technology, whether it's a coffee machine or a modem or a printer. If it knows, if you are in a hurry, or you have a deadline pending, it knows and it's gonna malfunction. So please don't put things off to the last minute because you will have an issue. Work ahead as much as possible, fill out as much as you can ahead of time so you don't have a malfunction. If your technology malfunctions, email me as soon as you can, get a hold of me as soon as you can and we can figure out a way to work around it. Um, Technology can be really, really great and it can bite you in the butt too. Okay, questions before we hit the, fill the calendar? Going good? Oh, I'm getting tired already. This is such a long class. Every summer I'm like, whew, whew, when we make it to the end. Okay, so these are the chapters that are pretty much laid out. We're gonna cover them in just the order that they're in the textbook. These organized in basically the same units of chapters. Um, I am adding in about APA at the beginning and about using R. And I'm gonna try to add a little bit more data manipulation and application as we go forward because it's really important for you to know. Um, so yeah, so the way it is now, the discussion points are due the day we cover it in class. Now, chapter one, I'm not having you do a discussion point because you would have already had to have done it before we met today, which would have been silly. But for next time, you need to have done the discussion point on chapter two, which is exploration of data with plots. So I guess you have two things for homework. One is the installation of the software and two is to read and do your discussion point for chapter two. Um, so our first exam, will be open May 11th and 12th. So the exam has to be done by midnight on May 12th and your homework through chapter four is due that day at midnight as well. So that's our first deadline for homework and exam is May 12th. And so this first one has a lot more chapters. It has four chapters in it, but these chapters are a little thinner material. You'll notice that this blue chapter also has four, but after that, 
that you have three or two chapters per unit because there's a lot heavier material in those chapters. Sarah? So yeah. Um, just to clarify, I think you already said this, but mm -hmm. so all of the homework assignments are due for that exam, the day of that exam. The day of that exam. The, the, the day, and the exam is open for two days. It, the homework's due the last day, by midnight on the last day of the, the exam is open. But the discussion points are due. The discussion points are due earlier. So they're before we talk about the material in class. So here I've gone back to Canvas and I've clicked on the syllabus part of the menu. So here you can see the deadline. So today, um, it's the fourth, so Wednesday's the next day, so there's two discussion points due for next time. One is to introduce yourself, with, which almost everyone's done. Remember, you have to post something yourself, and then you have to respond to somebody else. Okay. So there's those two things. So discussion zero, most of you are pretty much done with that. So for Wednesday, you need to do a discussion point and a response on chapter two material. So if I go into the discussion points, I have them each chapter listed separately. So you'll go into now, discussion one on APA variable scales rounding. Notice it doesn't have a little green like icon there with the little piece of paper with a pencil or that's because this one's not graded. But this chapter two is graded. It has that little green thing and it gives you the deadline out to the side. It says that it's due May at 10 30 p.m. Okay. So this is where you'll go in and you'll put some kind of summary-ish thing about chapter two material and then respond to somebody else's by 10 30 the net on Wednesday. Right. Okay. Does that clarify on when? So the discussion points are due before every class. So basically you're going to be doing these between every pair of classes. And there is one homework assignment due this Friday. And let's, no, none of the homework, the discussion points are due boom, 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 like every class day, but right. the homeworks are only due on the, when we have an exam. Okay, just it oh, says. Oh, yeah. these are not. Oh, I will change these. Thank you, because homework one should be due. Oh, I think it's the only one that's wrong. Homework one should be due down here on May 12th. So that's okay. a mistake on my part. I will change it. So homework one is due with homework two, three, and four, and exam one has to be done by midnight, May 12th. Okay. Yeah, that's a good find. Homework one, change due date, May 12th. I'll change that one. But you'll see that I think, let's make sure I got all the rest of them. Yeah, homeworks five, six, seven, and eight are due with exam two on May 19th. Homeworks 9, 10, 11 when we have exam 3, 12, 13, 14, 12, 13, 14. Why is 16 here? Chapter 16 needs to be moved because chapter 16 homework should be due down here. There's a second mistake. And then 19 or 20 are done down here. Yep. Okay. Homework's due when we take the exam. All right, whew, done with syllabus. Okay, it's been an hour of talking. Let's take like a five minute break, shall we? Everyone can get up, walk around, get a drink, bathroom break if needed, wiggle, stretch the legs. <laughs>
How are you doing, Alyssa? I'm good. How are you? I was talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what a teacher does, though, right? I know. It's so much different when you can't see the student's eyes, though. Ah, uh, gotcha. It makes sense. It's communicating on the computer format is so different. Um, I, I'm working from home, and so we're doing distance meetings all the time, and it's just kind of like people will crack a joke, and everyone's on mute, and so it just doesn't fall. It doesn't carry. It doesn't, and so it's just kind of funny when you're like, this is awkward, I'm laughing, but no one else is. I found it funny. Anyway, it's just comical. I mean, I'm glad we have this option with what's going on, but mm -hmm. it's definitely not the same. It is absolutely not the same. Um, and I did look uh, about that 7610 class you were talking about. I'm in a master's program, and so it's not required oh. for me. Okay, which, which, which department program? Uh, instructional Technology and Learning Sciences. Okay. So it is a part of their doctorate program, mm -hmm. but it's just not for the master's. Yeah, so for four master's degrees, they should be asking you to take 6050. Not 6600. 6050? 6050. So 6050 covers everything we're, we're doing in this class and everything in 7610, but with less depth. So you can get ah. all the material in one three credit class. It was developed for master students that only have room for one three credit stat class instead of both of them. 6050. 6050. So here's, I'm going on the, I'll mention it. Yeah, so that's, it, I would see, I would talk to someone about that, like in the next day or two, I would send an email today to ask, really, am I supposed to take 6,600? Because it's not supposed to be a standalone. Sometimes they will have students that are doing a master's degree, take 6,600 if they're planning or have a high chance of going on to a PhD. But if it's a terminal master's degree, that should not be the case. Okay. So I'm on the college's website on that middle word on the menu that says research. Mm -hmm. um, it says course descriptions. So here it is, the 6050 is applied statistics. It's the intro stats methods for commonly used for education, social, and health sciences that covers all of this stuff but in a single semester and it's offered in the spring. It does not require the pretest, which is a nice thing. Right. This is the class we developed on purpose for people that only have room for one class, like the master's gotcha. programs. Okay. So it may or may not make a difference in your case, but it should make a difference for the degree program. Like they should incorporate that. They should. <laughs> He's been Sean uh, Whiteman, the associate dean for research, and his predecessor, Jameson Fargo, and I, we've been preaching this for five years now. We developed the course for them because they requested it, but it hasn't gotten implemented in all the course requirement um, for all the degree programs yet. Gotcha. Okay. So if they say, no, we want you to have 6,600, I'm happy to have you, but it to, it's to your disadvantage because you won't get regression. Makes sense. Is so there, I, I don't know if they, I think that they intend, like they have it set up as a, the master's program is kind of just the stepping stone for the doctorate, which is why it's in the program requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really know. Yeah. If I don't know how lucky I would be to be like, do I really have to take this? They probably. If, yeah. If you're doing a master's on the way to a PhD, then this class is the one you'll want to take. But if you're terminating at the master's, this is not the one you want to take. Good to know. Okay. But some people say, we want them to have the rigor of 6,600, to which I say, what's going to be more useful in their, their real career? <laughs> I have rigor in other places. So <laughs> Yeah, really. How much rigor do we need? Exactly. Pretty sure the program itself is pretty rigorous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey Sarah, is this 6770? Do you know if that's offered in the fall? Let's see, 6770. Qualitative, I have no doings with qualitative anything, but um, pulling up the website, here we go. It says that it's offered in fall and spring. 
on the website. Do you know if that's distance or how do you tell if that's distance? I don't know. Um, okay. The person, let's see, who could I put you in contact with? You hey, can email. Melissa, yeah. Let me, if you just go into Banner and if you search for the classes for fall, you'll be able to see either Logan main campus or Logan online and broadcast or the specific broadcast sites. And if it's broadcast, it'll show up there. And if it's not, it'll just show up on Logan main campus. That's so how I've been looking doing. at spring. They don't have it in banner yet. So not, yeah, not spring, yeah. but that's what they've got For in fall. fall. Um, Sean Whiteman would be someone to contact. Um, he's the associate dean for research to, he would be a good person to ask what they plan like in the spring. Uh, but Kimberly's right, for the fall, Banner would be the place to look. But I don't know what the ongoing plan is since I don't do any qualitative anything. Oh, thank you. I'm just trying to lay everything out to turn in my progress to my- Your plan of study and, yeah. I was like, oh, I need to figure this out. Are you through Teal, Melissa? Yes. Hit more, email Kit more. She's okay. all over the scheduling. So I bet she could let us know. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say Sean would be the one to point. I know would point you because I don't know who's in charge of every program, but yeah, Kit is on top of things. Yeah. Anyone else think of anything to ask during the break? <laughs> um, how do you want us to show that we've downloaded R? Just doing the work. You're on your honor, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Good. Yeah. So, so we have an hour down. We have what? Not quite an hour left. Um, so the things that we're going to go over now include how to, I'm going to show you how to download our, our studio and tech. And okay. it, that's what you're assigned to do. There's no, nothing to turn in for it. Um, if you have issues, which there's always at least one computer in the group that doesn't want to play nice. If it's your computer, email me and we can do a private Zoom and get your computer running. Um, you just, you want that all three of those on your computer and running for class next time so you can follow along. Because every assignment from here on out, I think there's like one that's the exception, but all but one assignment, you have to do some part of the assignment in R. And so I will know it's not working because you won't be able to do the homework. <laughs> and you will be super frustrated. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so when I said your assignment is to install R in R Studio, there's nothing to turn in. There's no grade associated with it. That's just like your to-do list item. The discussion point will be graded and you have to like do that in Canvas, but the ins installation of software, that's just a to-do item. So before we do that, I want to go over um, just a little bit more on the textbook. So let's see. I'm gonna my, my move talking head, I'm going to put over there again. Okay. So from Canvas, so I'm going to go back to the Canvas homepage. I'm clicking on this second hexagon, the one with the little box plots that says stat foundation or plural stat foundations. And um, coming down to the, at the bottom, this um, table, I'm going to do for these first two PowerPoints we're going to go over. So the first one's on the textbook. The second one's on APA format. We're going to take about 10, -ish, 10 minutes on each of these. And then we're going to go into R, how to, and specifically how to download it. And that's where we're going to focus on today. Um, rather than doing this PowerPoint, I'm going to show you the encyclopedia to walk through because it has all the screenshots in it. That's more up to date. So again, we're going to do this first PowerPoint about the Cohen's textbook. Okay. And my pens are in the way. Uh, oh, that did the wrong screen. Let's put this over here. Oh, it's doing the wrong screen. No, well, we'll just do it this way. All right. All right, so the Cohen, Cohen textbook. Just as a side note, this author's name is Barry Cohen. This is not the Cohen's as in Cohen's D, the effect size, if you've heard of that, not the same person. 
kind of advantageous that he has the same last name, you know, <laughs> probably helped him get a publication deal. But um, so I talked about before, the textbook is laid out with three subsections of every chapter. Section A um, gives you the simplest case for that type of procedure. It gives some definitions and some basic information. Um, and then at the end of that section, it has a summary for section A, it'll have a summary and then it has some exercise problems. So section A has some problems and they're numbered one, two, three, four. It's kind of not my favorite because then in section B, at the end of section B, there's another set of problems and they start with number one, two, three, four. And then in section C, there's some more problems at the end and they also start one, two, three, four. So when you're trying to, on a discussion board or in an email or one-to-one, -one, say, I have a question about problem number one, that's not good enough. You have to say in chapter one, section B, problem number one. So when you're referring to any of the questions on the homework, please say what chapter, section, and then the number so that we can all know what we're talking about. I wish that they had numbered them sequentially within the chapter, but they didn't. Each section ABC starts over with a one, two, three. But so A, section A is kind of the introduction, the simplest case, some basic stuff. And B gives you more of the general cases, some more computationally intense formulas, some more information, and usually includes how to report the result of that procedure in APA format, which is important because it's one thing for us to know what the results mean and it's another to be able to communicate them to someone else. And by and large, everyone in this college, most of the departments and programs use APA format. So that's what we're going to teach, how we report it in APA and summarize the results of a test. Um, and then, like I said before, Section C shows you how to do that thing in SPSS and we are replaced. So I do not care if you ever look at a section C. You, when you're doing your summaries and your chapter readings, you can ignore section C, except for the problems at the end, which we are gonna do using R. But as far as how to do it in SPSS, you can just ignore it unless you really wanna know. So when you're doing your chapter readings and summaries, focus in on section A and B. Um, and again, we're not going to focus those on section C. So this next slide just has the list of the chapters. So it's the same that we saw in the syllabus. There are at the end of the textbook, three appendices, and you need to get familiar with these. So the appendix A has a bunch of statistical tables. It has a Z table, a T table, the chi-square table, an F table. It's got a bunch of tables. And as we cover material, we'll bring these up and how to use each table as we get to them, but that's where you find them in the textbook. You do not need to memorize these tables. <laughs> I will have snippets of them on the exams if you need them for the exam. Or you can have your textbook handy to look it up if that's easier for you to have it. You just need to know how to use them and again, we'll learn it as we go. The second appendix has selected answers to the homework questions. This is less important to you now because you'll be able to check your answers in Canvas, but they do have some of the answers there. But you can check all your answers in Canvas with the atomic assessment. And then section C, appendix C, talks about a specific data set and it's named, the name is IHNO and it's said ENO. Eno is supposed to be the last name of a graduate student who is doing some research, and this data set is the data collected. But I figured out by the second time I taught this class, it does say it's made up data. So I don't know why they went with the name Eno instead of Smith, but the way it's Eno's data set. And in the back of the book, it has the data set actually printed out. There's a hundred people in this data set. You do not need to type that into your computer. I, it's already, the textbook came with it and it ha, you had a link that no longer works to downloading the data set. Um, I have it in Canvas for you. So we'll just download it. Do not type it into the computer. I had someone try to do that the first semester and don't do that. 
So E knows data set. So this is the supposed advanced PhD student who is TAing stats classes, like undergrad stats. And again, the sample size is 100. So there were 100 students in this class. And it probably was a real data set, and they just generated fake data based on the real data for confidentiality or something. But there are these 100 students who and it is sure to tell us that they voluntarily consented and they used IRB procedures and all that. But basically, we have this data. Um, some data was collected on the first day of the stats class. And they asked them to fill out a background questionnaire with things like, what's your gender? What major are you in? Why are you taking the stats class? Interesting. They asked them if they had a coffee drinking habit. And that was a yes or no question. And they asked them how many math classes they had completed prior to this. So that was like the background questionnaire. Then um, they had them take a math placement quiz, a 10 point quiz. It is interest this or this quiz was prior to registration. So maybe it was a pre test like you had to take the 6600 pre test. Um, it is interesting of these 100 people. There are 15 that are missing this math pre test. So we get a little taste of missing data in this data set. Um, they also, on that first day of class, asked them to rate their math phobia from zero to 10. So I know some of you would probably rate it maybe as a one, others of you as a 10 plus, but they asked these students to. Um, and then a week later, or later on in the semester, they did an experiment. Now, a week before the experiment, they had them take a regular stats quiz. So the background information we have on all these people are their gender, their major, why they're enrolling, do they drink coffee, how much math have they taken, what's their math phobia score, we have their math quiz score and a stats quiz score. So that's like all the background information we have on these people before the experiment starts. We are going to be using this data set, Eno's data set, in every chapter of this class. And so we can have some consistency. This data set has categorical variables, continuous variables. It has repeated measures. So we can use this as an example for everything we're going to learn in this class. Every section C, so we said the textbook has all these section C about how to do it in SPSS. All of the homework problems that are in where is, oh wait, that's not the right slide, this one. All of the section C exercises, all of those questions that I ask you to do in R, all of them use Eno's data set. And that's why I wanted to kind of talk about it before you start doing homework. So we're gonna use this data set again in everything, so every chapter. So we have all this background information on these 100 students, except for the 15 that are missing their math test. So this is how the experiment went. At, um, so at the start of class, um, they taught the students, so this is before, at the very start of the class, they taught students how to take their old pulse, and they took two baseline pulse measures, how to measure their pulse in beats per minute, and they did that twice, and they, um, so they, and they, I think they averaged them. So we have their baseline pulse at the beginning of class. They asked them that how many cups of coffee had, that they had that morning and how, um, what was their anxiety level? And um, one of the things they asked was like, how anxious are you? So they did this, they had them take their pulse, how much coffee have you drank and how anxious are you? And then they said, surprise, we're having a pop quiz. And what do you think happened with their pulse and their anxiety levels? Yeah. So they said, here, we're having a pop quiz. And the pop quiz is going to, that usually has 10 questions, is going to have a special 11th item that's going to be worth three bonus extra credit points. And they're really trying to make that anxiety level and that um, heart rate go up. Um, what they did not tell the students is not, not everyone was going to get the same quiz. So that bonus question was randomly assigned. I don't know how they actually, they probably just shuffled the papers before they handed them out. But for a fourth of the class, their bonus question was very, very easy. 
For a fourth of the class, they had a moderate difficult question, a fourth had a pretty difficult question, and a fourth of the class, their bonus question was impossibly difficult. So that's the random assignment, that how hard that 11th bonus question on the quiz was. Um, so they said, surprise, we're having a pop quiz. And then they remeasured their anxiety and their pulse. And then they had them take the quiz and they answered, they remeasured their anxiety and pulse. So they have three different measures of pulse, their heart rate, and three different measures of anxiety. They, they call them baseline, pre, and post. The baseline is before they have anything, just at the start of class. After the announcement, they call it pre-quiz. And then after the quiz was over, they call it post-quiz. So we're going to be um, dealing with these different anxiety and heart rate measures and see what happened. And did it depend on what their gender was? Did it depend on how much coffee they drank? Did it, can we use, does major influence what happens with their pulse and heart rate or, or their anxiety levels? Because we have some economics majors, but we also have some social science majors. Do you think that their heart rate did the same thing? We have lots of hypotheses we're going to test about this data through this class, and we're going to use the tools we're learning to test those hypotheses. And, you know, what happens with, their, with that quiz score. So that's the data set that we're going to use for the Section C questions on the homework. Questions about the textbook or Eno's data set. We're going to get really acquainted with it as we move forward. No? Okay. Let's see if we can take less than 10 minutes to go over APA style. So APA style is the second PowerPoint that I've put on the website. This is what I care about in APA style. I don't care about how you cite references. I don't care about page margins. The things that I care about when I say APA style for this class, this is just for this class, I care about um, how you format numbers, how you report statistics, and the language you use reporting statistics, tables, and figures. Those are the things that we're, when I say APA format for this class, that I care about. So one of the parts of the homework asks you to skim over an article and find some errors in the article as far as the APA format goes. I want you looking at the numbers and the tables and the figures and whenever they're talking stats, methods, and results. Those are the, that's what I want our focus to be on. So APA, everyone know what APA is? Heard of it? No? Um, I think we're good. We are now on to the seventh edition of the APA. And I think I took my manual home. I don't have it here still. Um, the seventh edition just came out this past year. It largely, the oh, there it is. Kelly has it. You want to hold it up? Yeah, I have that one too with the tabs and the spiral. That's, it's awesome. Mine's like tabbed up all over the place. So if you're going to do a thesis or a dissertation, this is the format you're going to be required to use more than likely. Um, journal, most journals um, in the disciplines that you guys are in you require APA, except for they say they require APA, but they all have their own little take on APA. So I'm going to teach you what APA is, but there is a chance that if you submit to any given journal, they have their own like exceptions to the rules and you just go with the flow. So um, homework for this class, we're going to learn how to write our conclusion statements in APA format where you put the numbers, how you format the numbers. Um, so here are the bullet points that I want to really pull out. Number one, numbers. If you're writing a sentence and you say a number, like people were randomized into one of four groups, if the number is less than 10, you should use the word, F-O-U-R, for the number and not the digit four. So that's the rule. In sentences, if the numbers a single digit number, you write the word out. This second bullet point is a big one, and I'm going to be grading you on this. And when you check your am answers in Canvas, it will be wrong if you don't follow this rule. If we have a number that's a small number and we ha it has a decimal in it, sometimes we put the zero in front of the decimal and sometimes we don't. 
the rule is if the number is always a decimal number, like it's always point something, you do not put a zero in front of the decimal. So an example is a p-value. So a p-value, the biggest a p-value can be theoretically is one, but in real life it's always point something. So a p-value never has a zero in front of its decimal. Another example is correlation. Correlation is, can be positive or negative, but it's always between zero and one. So we always do it like 0.78. We do not put the zero in front of the decimal because it's never going to have a number in front of that decimal. If it's always required to be point something, you don't put the zero out front. The other thing, which is kind of a less of a big deal, I think for us, is that if we put a decimal, like if we put n equals 5.0, that gives the impression that it could have been 5.1. So if something has to be a whole number, we never put a decimal after it. So if n is used for sample size. Sample size is a whole number, should be a whole number, right? We either have four people or five people. We don't have 4.2 people. So in that case, we would never put the 0, 0.0 at the end of it. That comes up less often. This fourth bullet point comes up a lot with SPSS especially. Oh, it makes me so tired. P-values are never exactly one and they're never exactly zero. They're always something between one and zero. So when you report your p-value, it should never be a number that's all zeros. So SPSS is world renowned for it will show a p-value as point zero 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 stop. That cannot be true. There's always a number somewhere out there. In R, it will use, if it's that tiny of a number, it will show it in scientific notation, and I'll point that out when we get there. But if a number is super, super tiny, and we're only showing three decimal places, and so it would be 0. 0.00000001, we report the p-value like this. p is less than 0. 00, however many decimal places we're going, and the last number is a 1. This last um, bullet point is just pointing out the rule from before. A p-value is never going to have a number in front of that decimal. So we leave off the zero. So a p-value would say was equal to 0 0.006. I know it sounds kind of silly. We do not write the p-value 0 0.006. And again, this will get marked wrong on the homework because I want to, you know, drill this in. Are we good there? Again, we'll hit these all. Every time we learn a new method, we'll hit each of these. Um, there are a lot of abbreviations that we're gonna use with statistics, and some of them you can use without saying what they are. And um, the first one is mean. An average in stats lingo we say is the mean. We mean an arithmetic average, the average that you learned in grade school where you add up the numbers and divide by the how many you had. Capital M is for mean. Now, if you had a stats class before, what did we use to represent the mean? It was not a capital M because in regular stats class, a capital M means median. Does anyone remember what we used? It's mu. Mu is for the population average. Anyone? Oh, okay. Sample average, anyone? X bar? X bar, very good, Alyssa, you get the gold star for today. Yeah, so we use X bar. In our formulas, you will see X bar, but when you write up your result in APA format, you use a capital M to, for the mean and SD, both capitalized for the standard deviation. Notice there's no periods after the M, no period after the S and the D, no space. S standard deviation is capital S, capital D, together with no decimal, no spaces. We are going and do to they need to be italicized like that? Italicized, true APA says you italicize them, but 
but almost no one ever does in journals. Yeah, Kimberly? How, what do they um, use for median then? For median, they use capital M, little d, little n. Uh, it really threw me for a loop because if you're coming from stats land, it's not the same. Okay. But we're going to learn it anyway. So that's because that's how you're going to read it in journals right. and that's how they're going to want you to report it in your thesis, your dissertation, and if you go to publish anything. If you're doing a poster for a um, presentation at a conference, you're going to want to use this as well. So right. we're going to learn it every, in every chapter, we're going to add to our APA formatting knowledge. So I'm not going to go heavy here. Yeah. Um, so back one page on the, uh, on the P value, mm -hmm. if, so I was just a little confused on the second bullet from the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's less than 0 0.001, do I show all those zeros or I do, I just show the two zeros in the one, mm -hmm. if it's less than that. Yeah. Yeah, so this has been this has been one of the movements in social sciences, and that includes psychology and teaching. Um, in the past, a lot of times people have reported p-values just in terms of is it less than 0.05 or greater than 0.05. Mm -hmm. That no longer flies. Okay. Now, you if you try to publish something like that, I get people that come to me for consultations that they get a revise and resubmit that ask them, we want Naaman Pearson p-values and you'll see this in each journal has like instructions to authors you'll see that language used that means they want the p-value in three at least three decimal places um, usually with APA we give the p-values to three decimal place accuracy for the most part sometimes you'll do four but generally it's three um, they want all three numbers after the decimal place the only exception is if they're all zeros and the first non-zero number is like way out there, you use the less than 0.001. If okay. you, it's very important you're consistent with the number of decimal places you're using within a, a manuscript, whether that's thesis, dissertation, or journal article. If you're going with four decimal places, it would be the smallest number would be P is less than 0 0.0001. If it's a really small number, it's gonna be zeros, but the last number has to be at least one. <laughs> and you'd use the less than instead of the equal sign. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna get to, you guys are gonna like be doing this in your sleep by the end. Yeah, okay. Another thing, um, so abbreviations and methodology, you are required to describe. Anytime you use an abbreviation, the first time you use it, you have to put it all in words and then in parentheses, you can put the abbreviation. And then after that, in the document, you can use the abbreviation. There are some exceptions. A mean and standard deviation, you can use the capital M and the capital SD without saying that's what they are. It is assumed that everybody understands that M is always median and SD is always standard deviation, and you don't need to say that. There are some methods, like ANOVA methods. You don't have to describe an, what an ANOVA method is. It's assumed knowledge in most realms. That's why this is in your foundation class. So if you're doing an ANOVA model, you don't have to go into the details of what an ANOVA model is. But if you're gonna use something like a mixed effects regression, that's not a standard technique in hardly any field. So you would have to have probably at least a paragraph describing that method. Um, most everything that's covered in 6600 and 7610 is assumed to be common methodology and doesn't need details about what the method is. Um, if it's rare or a newer method, you have to describe the method in your manuscript, just as a note. Um, so statistics, if you say M equals five comma SD equals six, you don't have to say what M and SD are. Um, but you only would use those abbreviations, M and SD, if it's inside of parentheses. If you're writing a sentence and you wanna talk about the mean being higher for men than women, within a sentence, it is not okay to use the abbreviation. You actually have to write out the word. So that capital M for mean only can be used in parentheses or a table. It cannot be used in a sentence. You actually have to 
type out M-E-A-N in the sentence itself. And you can arrange sentences either way, but just know the abbreviations only belong in parentheses or tables. Kind of fun, right? No. Okay, we are gonna learn to report things like this last one. I'm not gonna take any time to do it today, but just know that as we learn each method, we're gonna learn how to write these sentences with our result, what abbreviations we should use, what decimals to use, and what order to put things in. And I have some documents on Canvas, or I can point you at some for different methodology outside of this class, but basically those are our rules um, that I want you to know. I think those are the most important ones. Um, I'm not gonna go through a lot of those other examples because we'll get there when we get there. But, but I'm gonna skip down to the tables and the figures. When you have a table or a figure, it must be able to stand on its own. Oh, we get out at 415, right? I was thinking 315, oh yay! I was like, we're never gonna finish. Oh yay, I just had a moment. <sighs> okay, tables and figures have to be able to stand on their own. Have you, have you guys ever read an article? What's the first thing you look at? After the title. The abstract. And the app, you read the abstract to say, is this something I'm interested in? And then do you just start reading sentences in a row? Or do you kind of flip ahead and see, is there a table or a figure somewhere? <laughs> so I feel like you want us to say it's the table or the figure, but I don't understand the math. So I always go to the words. <laughs> you always go to the words. Oh, maybe you'll change your mind by the end. That's my goal <laughs> is to change your mind, Sam. I would have to agree with Sam. I usually end up reading the words or just down to like the conclusion, the, the very conclusion. last paragraph, and it tells me everything I need to know. <laughs> yeah. So tables often get skipped, but sometimes figures catch eyes. Would you say a figure would catch your eye, maybe? So the goal with our tables and figures is to um, have a lot of information in a smaller amount of room. So they say a picture can be worth a thousand words. It can be. And so can a table. So this is where we're going to put a lot of information because sometimes statistically we have a lot of information. And if you try to put that many numbers in a sentence, who's read a sentence that was more numbers than words? Yeah. How easy is that to read? It's part of why we don't understand what that's why you don't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of a rule of thumb that I use, and it's not like my personal one, a lot of, I stole it from someone else who stole it from someone else. A good rule of thumb is if your sentence has more than say four or five numbers in it, you might want to think about making a table. If your table has more than maybe 10 or 20-ish numbers, maybe you should think about making a figure. It's all about being able to digest the information. And if you have too many numbers in a sentence, it get, the numbers get in the way of the words. If you have any, too many numbers in a table, your eyes can't find any patterns. So, but it, you don't need a figure if you only have two numbers. So deciding when you should have a sentence versus a table versus a figure is not always clear, but there are some guidelines like that. And we will see what are tables and what are figures that go with certain methods as we learn them. This is a really dumb question. What's oh. the difference between a table and a figure? A table is usually like a grid, like with numbers only. A figure is usually like a plot. So we usually have lines and dots or bars, or it's more of a figure is anything that's a plot or a picture nature that's not just rows and columns of numbers. So in APA format, you usually have tables and figures and they're numbered. You'll have table one, table two, table three, and then you'll have figure one, figure two, figure three. Now you're not required to have tables and figures, but usually most of the time in a manuscript, different manuscripts, different journals will limit you sometimes to only at most three tables and three figures, or sometimes they'll say at most four tables and figures combined. If you're doing your thesis in your dissertation, I would say the more is better. Generally, there are 
mentors that disagree with me on that, but um, they should have a purpose. A table or figure should have a purpose and they should be able to stand on their own. So if you flip to a table or a figure based on what it says in words, either on in the table and figure or with the title or the caption or the notes, you should be able to figure out what's going on. All abbreviations should be noted and there should be some kind of description so that the person looking at it knows what they should be looking at. So when we make tables and figures, um, you need to think about what's the purpose and what should your audience be gaining from this table or figure and tell them what they should be seeing when they look at this table and figure. Um, let's see what else is on this slide. They're always named sequentially. This is important. Your tables and figures, and this is not for homework in this class, but just for your information. You number them in the order that you talk about them in the manuscript. So if the first thing you talk about is almost always your sample, this sample had 100 students that were half male and half female and were 90% white. Usually you describe your samples before you talk about the measurements. So usually we have the first table in a manuscript is almost always the description of the sample and descriptive like mean and standard deviation of all the variables that you measured on your sample. So table one is usually descriptives. Not always, but usually. So you can have tables that are descriptive in nature, which give subgroup size, like male versus female, different ethnic groups, whatever's pertinent to your sample, and means and standard deviations of ages or experience or whatever's pertinent of a continuous variable. So you ha can have tables that just contain descriptive information. And then you can have tables that have inferential information. Inferential means statistics, and we'll come back to that word another day. But it's more model-based. So ANOVA or multiple linear regression, that's what this abbreviation is meaning. So a statistical model. You can also have tables that are a combination of the two. Um, some APA rules about tables. If you have a cell, so if I have a cell that has like males and females, and then it has the number of whatever, like maybe one of my variables is yes or no, they're taking um, hormone estrogen hormone replacement therapy. For men, it would probably be not applicable. So if you ever have a cell in your table where there's no one there because it just ain't possible, it's not applicable, not applicable cells should be blank. Cells where data was not able to be computed or didn't exist, we usually put a dash in there. So these are what, how you use, whether you should leave a cell or a spot in your table blank or put a dash, depends on if it's not applicable or if it's just not obtainable. That's a, a minor point, but it is a point that you'll see sometimes in tables, you'll have these dashes in empty cells, and that means that they were not able to compute that thing that should the number that should be there. So tables, we always put a title on a table and it goes at the top, TTT. Tables get titles at the top. Figures get captions at the bottom. The APA rules, not my own. So for a table, they should have a title at the top. The title should be descriptive and the first letter of each word is capitalized. So it's like a book title kind of on a table. There's no period at the end and the title should be on the row after it says table one. And sometimes, you can love that word sometimes, sometimes they're italicized. So in your doc, in a manuscript, it will say table one and on the next line I'll say description of description of independent variables or description of sample or summary statistics for the sample. The title where every word has the first letter capitalized. Below a title, a table, you can have captions and notes. You can have general notes that explain what symbols and abbreviations mean, that you can have um, summary information if needed, like the total sample size, 
And you can have, if you're using subscript to denote certain things, you have that at the bottom. If you're using asterisks to represent p-values, that should go underneath the table. We'll see some examples of this. I think there's one on the next page. Here is a table. So here's the table. Most of you ask for the table. We have this like grid of numbers and we've got rows and columns. Notice this one has M and then in parentheses SD. So what do I know 5.67 is? 5.67 is the average for variable one in group one. This is a very generic table. Um, here is a table that came out of a manuscript. Can somebody find at least, there's multiple things, but something that is wrong with this table? Shouldn't the title be after table one? Yeah, so this I title, this title, Basic Characteristics in 26 Subjects, each word should be capitalized and it should be on its own line. It should say table one and then underneath it should be the caption or the title. It's not a caption, it's a title. Also in parentheses it said mean values. They could have used just the capital M there. Um, the other thing is these asterisks with the p-values, that according to APA, that should begin on a new line and be flush left. And then said they've chosen to put it in parentheses. Now, like I said, APA is a list of guidelines and it's very this is how you do it. But then every journal decides how they're going to do it. <laughs> Even though they say they're an APA journal, that they follow APA format, then they do stuff like this that isn't truly APA. Um, so on part of the first homework assignment, I have a journal article, a couple of them for you to look at and find things like this. It's not that this is wrong, it's just not strictly following the APA guidelines. And if you're submitting an article to a certain journal, do whatever they want you to do. But if they don't say otherwise, follow the APA guidelines. Okay, so let's see, we got that. All right, so tables. Now notice they did something good here. Notice in this table, this one, two, three, fourth line, it says capital BSA. What's BSA? It's an abbreviation, anyone find out? Can you look on there and see where it's what? Body BSA? surface area. How did you know that? I read the subtitles. <laughs> there is at the bottom, there is a note that tells you what the abbreviation means. That is very important. In a table, if you use any abbreviation other than the accepted ones, accepted ones are the capital M, the capital SD, little n means, anyone have an idea? Little n? Sample population? Sample size. So we have nine endurance athletes nine power and fast power athletes and eight controls. N is usually a sample size. Now, should you use capital N or little n? No one's consistent. <laughs> In mathematical statistics, capital N usually means the population size and little n usually means sample size. But I see in social sciences, a lot of times they'll use capital N for the total sample size and little n for a subgroup in the sample. So if this was the whole sample, capital N would be 26, and then the little ends are 9, 9, and 8, depending on which subgroup you're talking about. So, but that's not always followed perfectly, even in APA, in my experience. So this is a table. It's a not perfect example of a table based on APA rules, but it's a pretty good table. Figures. So figures include charts, graphs, photos, drawing, images, diagrams, anything that's not a strict table of grid of rows and columns with numbers mostly. So again, it must stand on its own and it should have a purpose. And the purpose isn't just to look pretty. The purpose is to show something. Um, and you want to show it in the simplest way possible to make the point. And again, they're numbered sequentially, figure one, figure two, figure three, and there should be a space in between the word figure and the number. These don't look like they have a space in them. Now, tables have a title at the top, figures have a caption underneath it. So figure one goes underneath it, and then the caption 
also is below and it's immediately following on the same row, figure one. And then you start the caption. Um, it is not a title and it is not capitalized. It's just like a regular sentence with a period at the end. It should be brief, but it should explain what the figure is. So you could say, um, an interaction plot for a multiple or a mixed design ANOVA. You have to say what it is descriptively. Brief, but what is it? What is this figure for? What is it showing us? And then you can have more sentences after the first sentence that clarify. So it could say figure one. Interaction plot for a mixed design ANOVA, period. And then your follow-up sentence might say, the effect of gender is moderated by that, and you go on and have some more sentences. Again, we will practice this as we learn different kinds of figures for different kinds of models. If your figure needs a legend, the legend, according to APA, should be in the same font style and the font, same font size as the rest of the figure, so it's consistent. You don't wanna have really big letters on the, X and Y axis, and then little teeny tiny letters in your legend that should be consistently font sizes. So here are my two examples. So this first figure is not a traditional plot. This is more of, this is actually an SEM model, but notice it's not a grid of numbers. We have circles and squares and arrows and some numbers. And it says figure one period. And then we have not a capitalized every word title, but a sentence, latent, basic latent growth model with three waves of measurement, period. Just the caption is like a regular sentence that describes what in the heck this thing is. Didn't that go on the next line down after figure one? On a table, it says table one and then the title, mm -hmm. but on a figure, after figure one, the caption goes on the same line. Okay. There are different rules for type tables and figures, you know, to make life fun, right? So yes, this is good for figure one, where it says figure one, and then on the same line continues the caption. That's the way it should be. So this second example is a plot where we have a solid line and a dashed line, and they have the legend on the inside of the figure. That's a good thing to do. It's not required. Um, but notice where it says girls and boys, that's about the same font size and style as the x-axis and the y-axis labels. It, it needs to be in the same family of fonts. Here we have bolded font on the x and y-axis labels, but it's about the same size as the legend text. Um, again, it says figure two, and then it has a very brief sentence. Hours of sleep by sex of adolescence. It's a very brief sentence, but then they go on to give some more information. Now, generally speaking, I told you the capital M abbreviation for mean only belonged in parentheses. The exception is table and figures. So here they're using the capital M in a sentence and that's okay because it's the caption on a figure. Aren't these fun rules to follow? This is why um, we have this book and we keep it on our desk to refer back to over and over again. I don't memorize these things. Often I have to go and look like, what was it supposed to be on this one again? Um, so we will practice this though when we make our tables and figures. The nice thing is if you're using R, it automates a lot of this stuff for you. Plug for R, okay. Tables and figures. So what are the things I want you to know about APA format? When should I use a number versus the word? When do I put a zero in front of the decimal place? How do I give p-values, tables, and figures? Those are the things today that we've really pointed out. Not margins, not citations. You'll learn about that in a different class, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Cohen's textbook, APA. Intro to R. Is this the part? Who's ner most nervous about using R of everything in the class? There's always like half the class is most nervous about R. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So again, I am going to go to the encyclopedia. So on the Canvas page, it's that third hexagon, and it says encyclopedia. And I'm going to open it in a new tab so that doesn't go away. So I'm going to the encyclopedia, then I'm going into the upper right hand corner to volume links, and I'm clicking on the volume zero, it's red, it says software. If you go to our class page, it's linked also here, volume zero, setting up your computer, software. First thing we're gonna do, there it is, okay. Every one of these volumes has the first page layout, it's always like this. In this encyclopedia, which Tyson's supposed to be helping me write, but he hasn't yet, but I'm still co-authoring him because I hope he will soon. Um, there are some different blocks of color that you will see. The yellow with the cone means it's under construction. The red with an exclamation means it's very important, pay attention to this part. The orange with this little cloud is something you can download, a file or a program. The little light bulb in a purple block is something that's interesting I want to draw your attention to. The green one with the world in this chain is a link to a website that you can go to for more information. And then there's blue and gray bits. The blue rounded corner blocks is code. That's our code would be in those blue boxes with the rounded corners. The light gray shaded square boxes are going to show you the output that R gives you when you run the code in the blue box above it. Okay. So that's just for all of these encyclopedia pages. And so that's always in every one of my volumes in the welcome section. So this volume has six chapters. So we're going to go to chapter one, overview. R, R, R. Where does R come from? So the letter R here, we're talking about the programming language, not the letter. There's a whole blog that says R, the language, not the letter. Um, R, the history of R is that once upon a time there were statisticians that needed to do some programming and they had been using the programming language X. So if you have any computer background, computer languages are labeled with single letters. There was C and then C plus and C plus plus and C prime and then now there's, there's a bajillion languages. But S was one that was used by a lot of programmers because S was really, really fast, but it was owned by a company, Bell Labs, and they liked to charge a lot of money for their programming language. So there were some statisticians in New Zealand at a university that said, we don't want to pay a lot of money and we need to be able to use this. So can we come up with something ourselves that's free that can do the same thing? And so they started developing R, never thinking that would move outside of their kind of like lab group. But it was so great, it caught on and people started using it everywhere. I started using R 20 years ago um, when I started my master's degree. And at that time, we used it without an interface. It was computer, kind of like DOS. Does anyone remember DOS? Who's old like me? Um, you, get, you just type things out. There's no windows. There's no buttons. It's just command line. You had to spell things perfectly, and you had to know what the commands were because there was no point and click anything. Um, that's how I started learning R. And R is fabulous. It is really, really fabulous, but it didn't catch on outside of statisticians for a long, long time because you had to learn the language. And it was really hard to learn the language because it was like a raw computing language. Well, what's happened since then is we've had a movement in R with something that's called R Studio, which is one of many interfaces that make using R easier. And we've had the introduction of something called the pipe which I'm going to show you today, that makes reading and writing code easier for the human brain. Because the way computer language is usually written, I mean, ideally it's ones and zeros. That's what a computer thinks in terms of ones and zeros, ones and zeros. Um, and then you have these commands that code for ones and zeros. Um, but it's done with parentheses and it's really hard to read. But my boyfriend, let me see if I can get a picture. He's not really. His name is Hadley Whitcomb. Like, there he comes up. He, um, he's so cute. Isn't he so cute? Hadley Wickham. He's my boyfriend if I wasn't married and he wasn't gay. 
and like we'd ever met. But um, he is fabulous. So he um, has really turned things around. He said, okay, we spent all these years trying to make computer programs run faster. And we'll rewrite things to make an algorithm run instead of taking, you know, it used to be my mentor talked about days he was in his grad program would sleep in the computer lab next to the server in this little closet and have these punch cards they'd read in and then they would wait days for their program to run on these huge supercomputers. And now my watch does more than that and then some. And so now our computers run so much faster, like instead of trying to focus on a, making a program instead of running in nine microseconds and running eight microseconds, let's focus, he said, let's focus on the human computer interface. Is there a way we can speed up how we talk to the computer? And so he revised the way we write code so that it works with the way our brains have been trained to read. Now, how did you learn to read? What direction? Left to right, top to bottom. Not every culture has written that way, but most of us learn to read from left to right and top to bottom. Computer code is usually written from center to outside. And it's really hard for the human brain to retrain the way it thinks. And I know I did it, it took forever. And I still, you know, have to really think about what I want to write in code and then like manipulate it. And so the pipe, lets us write code left to right, top to bottom, stepwise. And so he, Hadley Wickham came up with this, implementing this idea into R. He's now the head data science at R Studio, and they have some tools that make R a lot easier. So the letter R came because the original scientists, statisticians in New Zealand were trying, they had been using S and they were kind of doing a play on words. And so they said, that's S, so let's change it a little bit. We'll call ours R. I don't know why R versus another letter, but you'll find statisticians naming things when we get into R. They kind of like to have a little fun with naming things. So R refers to the computer language. We are going to install R on our computers and then forever ignore it. R is like the engine that makes the car run. R is going to do all the calculations. But when you drive a car, do you work directly with the engine to make changes to your speed and your direction and all these things? No. I mean, in the very, very first cars, they had to like crank the engine and they were really hands on with the engine. But now when we drive a car, we have this like cockpit, right? We have all these dials and gauges and then we have the steering wheel that then works on the engine. And so R Studio is not the same thing as R, same R letter in it, but R Studio is an interface program that allows us to interact with R, the programming language, through a dashboard interface. And it has some really nice things like some point and click, it has um, help menus, which traditional R does not. It has autocomplete when you start typing. It has color coding, which help you find missing punctuation. So it's going to make our life easier. So for this class, I need you to in install on your computer that you're going to be working on. And again, this is freely available. So you can install it on every computer you own or just one. It doesn't cost any more. So R and R Studio, two separate things. Again, when R gets installed on your computer, you don't need a button for it. You're going to ignore it. You're never going to open plain R. Instead, we're going to open R Studio that's going to use R behind the scenes. You don't have to see R to use R, just like you don't have to see your engine to drive your car. Okay. There is, and I, I need to check and make sure these links still work. There's a data camp video that goes over that distinction there. Okay. So we have R as in R by itself and R as in R studio. Is that confusing? Then we're going to add two more R's. Okay. There are two different uses of R within R studio. We have R markdown and R notebooks. Letter R just gets be everywhere. 
R markdown is short notation, or R, we use RMD is the abbreviation. R, here it's, it has it right here, point, a decimal, and then point capital R, and then on a little MD. This is going to be our file extension. Instead of having a dot PDF or a dot PNG, they're going to be a dot RMD file. A dot RMD is an R markdown file, and it is just a plain text file that has dot RMD at the end of it. It's great that it's a plain text um, document because that means you can open it with any kind of program that can open a text file, like Word or WordPad or Notepad or any program that can open a text document can open an R markdown document, even if it doesn't have R installed on it. SPSS files can only be opened by SPSS. SAS files, Kimberly, can only be opened by SAS, or are they also text files? Are this SAS, SAS only. SAS only, yeah. Stata can only be opened by Stata. Statistica files can only be opened by Statistica, which what happens if you're on a different computer? You're up a creek. So this is a real benefit of R files, is the RMD, R markdown files, are just text files with a different extension. So they can be opened on any machine, no matter what it has installed on it, Mac, PC, whatever. So the difference is with an R markdown file, markdown refers to the way that you format it. So thinking about Word, and I'm old enough to remember Word Perfect, how do you change text so that it's, it's bold? Control B. Yeah, but first you have to highlight it. it and do either Control B or you click the bold button and then it shows you that it's bold. What do you do if you want to make something italics? Same thing. Same thing, highlight it and do Control I or the italic button. Mm -hmm. That's a GUI interface. You push the button and it shows you the changing in the format. Now, has anyone ever used Word and you're doing bold and italics or captions and you have something and you change it, but then you start typing and it bolds something you don't want to be bold? Or it won't bold and you're like, it's supposed to be bold. Have you ever had that headache? Mm -hmm. I have it all the time in Word. <laughs> um, that's one of the downsides of the button interface is that you can't see where the bold starts and stops when you start a space. If you have a space, is that space bold or not bold? And if you put your cursor there, is it going to type bold or not bold after a bold word? It's a guessing game. <laughs> and I usually guess wrong. I'm a bad guesser. So in Markdown, there are shortcuts instead of button pushing to change the formatting. If we want to do something in italics, you put an asterisk before and after surrounding whatever you want to be in italics. If you want something to be bold, you put two asterisks before and after whatever it is you want to be bold. You're going to see, see the formatting with asterisks, but the text itself looks the same. It doesn't like show up in bold when it's a markdown file. When you knit it, that's a fun word, knit, like grandma with her yarn and her knitting needles. When you knit your markdown file to a PDF file, then the formatting of bold or italics will show up. Now, bold and italics is not the reason that we're using this markdown. The reason that we're using markdown is it allows you to integrate together in the same text document plain paragraph sentences, computer R code, and the output that R makes in the same document. So this is a limitation of Statistica, Stata, SPSS, and SAS. In all of those programs, you can write code files, and you can run the code files, and you get output. But it is hard to integrate that with regular typing. R Markdown allows you to integrate together plain typing with your code and the code's output into a single document. And that's the benefit. 
So our markdown refers to having the formatting with things like asterisks to show bold and italics. And there's some other keys I'm going to show you to designate some parts as code and some parts as plain text. So I put together this little diagram. So this is an R notebook refers to like a scientist. If you're a scientist in a lab, you're a mad scientist and you have your chemical beakers everywhere. Um, when you took a science class, um, anyone take a lab science class like chemistry lab or something and you have those composition notebooks, right? That have all the lines. What do you do in your composition notebook? You write down numbers and measurements. You write down things that you see. You might draw a picture of what is happening. You might make a formula in there of the chemical reaction. You have all of those things integrated into your notebook. This is an electronic version of the scientific notebook. There, and these, this is an example of what the pieces that might be in your notebook. We're always gonna have a header at the top, a YAML header. I forget what YAML stands for, Y-A-M-L stood for something. Um, so you get the YAML header at the top, and then I have here in green, it says plain text, and then orange, it says code, and under the code chunk, it says R output. That's kind of a schematic of what it will look like for an R notebook file that is written in R markdown. For our homeworks, you're going to have one of these high files for every chapter. Now, the good news is I've written them for you except for the code. So you're going to, for each of these chapters, you're going to download from Canvas the RMD, the R Markdown file, and you're going to go into the empty code chunk and type in the code, and then you're going to run the file. We'll do the first one together, so don't get nervous yet. Remember, I'm here to help you. But th those are the pieces we're going to have. Um, there are some links here if you want to go watch some videos. So here is an example of a very, very brief R markdown file. So this says that this file is notes.rmd. That's the file name. Now, I want you to look at what's typed in this box. The first line says, what do you guys call that symbol that's the first of that line? Well, old school, it's the pound. Pound key, that's what I call it. I say pound. What do you younger people call that symbol? Hashtag. Hashtag, yeah. In our markdown, when you put a hashtag space, the stuff that comes after that is a title and it will format it as a title for you. So the hashtag means this is the title. If you put two hashtags, it's a subtitle. If you put three hashtags, it's a Sub subtitle. You can go up to six hashtags and you can do these titles to organize your document. And then after we have, so hashtag report, when we knit or run this document, we will get a title, like a cap, uh, section header that says report. And then here we have a plain sentence after it. We can see this relationship in a scatter plot. Notice the word relationship. What's surrounding the word relationship. On either side, there is a asterisk. When we run that file, look what happens to the word relationship. The asterisk in the RMD file translate to italics in the final document, the knitted document. Now, I said this, we're starting with notes.rmd when we knit it, and I put this yarn with the needle, what the process of knitting it converts the RMD file to a PDF. Notice what the name of this PDF is. The same name as the RMD file, but now it's a PDF version. What's the benefits of a PDF? Anyone can use it and see it. Anyone can use it and see it. You and can, the formatting doesn't change. The formatting is set. You can view it on even your phone and the formatting is set. What happens to a text file if you view, view it on a Mac versus view it on a PC versus view it on your phone? Has everyone, anyone ever full, pulled up a Word document on your phone? What happens to the formatting? It's <laughs> craziness. If you have a PDF, the formatting is set no matter what it's viewed on. And it can be viewed by pretty much any device. So we're using basically a text document that can be viewed on any device and converting it to a PDF document that also can be viewed on any device, but now the formatting is set. 
Now, in the, after that sentence with the word right, relationship asked with the asterisk, we have this code block. This is a block of code. The way you denote a block of code is the back tick symbol. Now, on your keyboard, this is the key that lives over by your escape key. This is not the quote key by the enter button. So if you look up by the escape key, there's a key right under escape on almost every keyboard. It has the back tick. It also has the tilde wave. That's the other symbol that's on that key. If you push the back tick button three times, tick, 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 that tells the computer that this is a code chunk. So you start and end the code chunk with triple ticks, with three tick symbols. At the start of the code chunk, in curly brackets, you have to tell it what kind of code it is. We are going to, in this class, only write R code. So notice the first thing in that curly brackets is the letter R. That means this code chunk contains R code. In R Studio, you can have R code, Python code, C++ code, lots of different computer languages. And you can use them together in the same document, which other people love. We're not going to go there. But we can have this letter R in the curly brackets to say this code chunk is an R code chunk. After that, you can name your code chunk. And you can name it Fred, you can name it George, or you can leave it unnamed, or you can name it analysis. You can name it something meaningful or something fun, or you can leave it unknown, loaded, unnamed. So notice this code chunk says P is a ggplot of my data with a given mapping, and I'm going to add to p the geometry of points. Now, you don't know what that means. I don't care that you know what that means at this point. But basically, this code chunk is telling the computer to make a scatter plot of, with points. Now, when we knit the document, we no longer see the code. Now we see the scatter plot that that code told the computer to make. And we're going to learn what to type to do different things. Now, your code can be included in the PDF or excluded in the PDF. I'll show you how to figure out which one you want to do and how to do that. But the goal here is that we're going to have this text file that's saved as a .rmd. And when we push the knit button, which actually has a ball of yarn and a knitting needle on it, we will create this PDF that has the code ran in it and it'll include any sentences we wrote with any formatting we specified, like captions and subtitles and italic symbols and lists and all those fun things. But more importantly, we have our code that does its thing. Okay. Now I've showed here knitting a RMD file into a PDF document, but the knit function can knit not just to a PDF, you can knit, knit to HTML, you can knit to slides. All of the HTML slides that we're looking at, like those two slideshows we just watched about APA format and the textbook, those slideshows were written in R Studio with R. This website we're looking at right now was written in R. I wrote the encyclopedia in R Studio as an RMD file, and I knitted it to a, a website using a package called Blogdown. You can actually knit to a Word document as well. The downside is Word documents look crappy when they're knitted, and it really is hard to deal with the formatting. Lots of people have tried over the last five years. There have been a lot of great packages that have come out. None of them have done a really great job, and it has to do with the way Word does formatting. So that's the only, the, the only negative that I've really came up with with this process is that once you knit to a PDF, the only thing like meaningful that I wish it would do is you can't do track changes in a PDF like you can in Word. And a lot of people, when you're working with other people in a group and you're doing track changes, it's, that's the only thing that's really hard to do here. And you will have groups and mentors that don't want to work with a PDF. If you're in the teal department, they don't want to do PDF. Um, but PDFs are very nice for most, a lot of things. And you can knit to Word if you need to. It's just not going to look as nice. So we're going to learn these skills in this class. Okay, so R, what is it? 
it's a computer language, but we're going to use the art studio interface so we don't actually have to learn the pure language, we can learn some shortcuts. What is our markdown? Our markdown is a formatting that we're going to use in our studio to write RMD files, our notebooks, so that we can knit them to PDF. Not a lot of fun words. A lot of if this is clear as mud, that's okay. We're gonna keep going on it. Um, let's go to the installation process. So we just went over chapter one, which is kind of an overview of all these R things. The chapter two is about installing these three pieces of software I need you to have. So let's go over them one at a time. Because remember, this is like your to-do list between now and next Wednesday is to install these three different softwares. Um, the good news is the first two are very, very quick. You could probably do them right now. Shall we try it? Okay, the R programming language. The R programming language is um, a collection of sites and servers with the R project. It's, we have CRAN, which is the comprehensive R archival network that kind of organize and keep everything together. It's nonprofits, that's how they can do it for free. So we're gonna to go to this website here, www.r-project.org. Kind of, it's not a very fancy website, but it does the job. So the first thing we're gonna click on is in that second line, it's in blue, it says download R. Now, let me take a poll. Who's on a Windows machine? One, two, three, four. Who's on a Mac machine? One, we're almost 50-50, usually it's this way. At some point, we're gonna, the Macs and the PCs have to do something different, but to start off, we're the same. So we're gonna click on Download R. When you click Download R, the next thing that comes up is a listing of the CRAN mirrors. So back in the day, when I was a young chick, um, we had internet that was called dial-up. <laughs> Anyone heard of dial-up internet? Yeah, it was really, really slow. And so when you were downloading something, you wanted to, you know, how far apart the two computers were made a big difference in speed. So when you downloaded, you wanted, if there were multiple places you could download from, you wanted to pick someplace that was close in miles to where you were at. Nowadays, it doesn't make a big difference. Um, also, the servers were not so good back in the day. And so if everyone was trying to download something from the same server, the server would crash. R, you know, computers are better, but there's, R is still really, really um, used by millions of people. And so one server can't service everyone. So this is a listing of all the ser cloud servers in the world that host R. To, for download. And any of these, you can select any of these and you'll get identical files from them. Uh, if I were you, I would scroll to the United States and still pick some server that's relatively close to your location. Um, there used to be some in California. They're not on here anymore. I'm just going to, man, I'm going to choose, who do I feel like choosing today? Washington. I'm going to choose Washington. You need to choose one of those. That just is which site you're gonna download your files from so that everyone's not downloading from the same site. And they call it a mirror because they're duplicate copies. It doesn't matter which one you get. Now this is where we diverge. If you're on a Mac computer, you're gonna select download R for Mac OS X. If you're on a Windows machine, you're gonna click download R for Windows. I'm on Windows. So Windows, we're gonna do the Windows version first. So if you're on a Mac, just hold tight. We'll do you next. If you're on a Windows machine and you click download R for Windows, now you're on this screen. You're gonna click, click on base. So click on the word base. This next screen, you're gonna pick on, click on the first line that says download R 4.0.0 for Windows. Now, depending on the speed of your internet, Mine is done. Now I'm using Chrome for my browser 
And with Chrome, it has downloaded it and it puts an icon in the lower left hand corner and I can double click and it will start the extraction process. It'll, um, when you double click on it, you know, now it's at, I had to click yes, allow this to make changes to my computer and I get to this point. I'm gonna hang here and I'm gonna back up for the Mac users, okay? We're gonna get the Mac users to this point. You ready, Mac users? Let's see, where is, okay. So that's what this is showing you. Okay, if you're on a Mac, you picked your mirror and you picked download for Mac, you're gonna look like this. So on the Mac, it's gonna have a lot of text. You're gonna go all the way down, just follow this red arrow, to where it says R and it's actually this is that it's going to say dash 4.0.0 PKG. That's what you want to click. Now when I took this screenshot, the latest version was 3.6.2. Yours should now say 3 4.0.0, right? Okay, if you click there, for Mac users, it should download the package file. I don't have a Mac. I love, I love Apple, but I don't have a Mac. Never have had a Mac. Um, do you guys know how to start it from here? Once you've downloaded it. Does someone have a Mac screen that they, a Mac and want to share their screen? What Mac users willing to be a guinea pig? I can try. Okay, Melissa, I'm going to stop my sharing and I am going to allow you to share. Okay, so for share screen in Zoom, you hover your mouse over all of our pictures and then down at the bottom in the center, you should see a green square with an up arrow. You see it, Melissa? Um, I'll let Laura do it. I think okay. Laura said, because I'm using a, a different computer than I'm in Zoom. Okay, Laura, can you do it? Okay, so yeah, hover over us and then at the bottom there should be a green square with the up arrow click it and then it'll give you a lot of things to choose from instead of choosing any one window choose the upper left hand corner that says screen or desktop upper left hand tile okay. and then you have to go down to the lower right hand and click share again can you see it or no not at oh let's see did it come yes it came can anyone else see Lara's screen Okay, good. You got it. Okay, Laura, so you want to click where it says latest release, the second section. Yep. Yeah, yes. so I, already, I actually already clicked on it. Okay, and it downloaded it there. Okay. And then it came up over here. In your downloads. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you click on the little box that's opening up. Okay. And then... It's bringing up the installer. Okay, so then just follow the prompts, right? Follow the prompts. Okay. So if you're on Windows, select English. I'm guessing we're all English here. And they should be very similar prompts to what Laura is seeing in Windows. You're gonna go with all of the, agree to everything, go with all the defaults, change nothing. Everything's okay, install to whatever location it wants. If you need to put a password in, if it asks you, is this okay, say yes. The defaults are what you want. So if you're on Windows, just go with the defaults. Just yes, yes, don't change anything. This one is fairly quick. R is pretty small of a program. See, all done. Yay! Okay. And then move to trash. But now you can move the installer to trash on the Mac. On okay. Windows, you can move the exe file to the recycle bin or the trash after you're done with the installation process. Thank you. I'm going to go back and share my screen. Welcome. That was great. Okay, so on my screen. So I had this choose a language. I'm going to say okay and yes, yes, just all the defaults. Yes, yes, yes. Now, when you get a new cell phone, what does it come with? 
when you turn on your brand new cell phone, does it come with everything you want? Mm, no, you usually have to make selections. Yeah. What about the apps? Does it come with all the apps you need? Majority of them. It comes with some helpful apps, but what if it ha you need to do something that you don't have an app for? You have to go to the app store. You go to the app store. So when you get a new cell phone, it just has like the bare bones on it. And that's good for a lot of stuff. But sometimes there's more that we want to do. And so we go to the app store to get a new app to add functionality to our operating system. R is the same way. We have just downloaded bare bones R. But it doesn't do everything that we could do. Now, if you get a new cell phone, are you going to go to the app store and download every app? Why not? Don't you want all those things? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, what would happen if you tried to download every app? You'd run out of space. You'd definitely run out of space. There are way too many apps for any one device to hold them all. So the same thing is true with R. R calls them packages, not apps but if our package adds functionality to do specific things. Now there are thousands and tens of thousands of packages out there and you, there's no way you can install all of them. It would never fit. Plus you're just going to bog down your computer. So what we've done right now is just download the bare bones R. It comes with some very helpful packages, but not every package. So in a minute, we're going to have to go get some more packages, but before we do that, let's download our studio. Okay. So congratulations if you've got an R. That's the first step. Now we're going to go get R Studio. Now we're going to go to a different website. R Studio is a company for profit, but we are going to get the free version. So this is what it looks like today. They change this landing page frequently. So right now they're doing um, Focusing on the home page on Python is another computer language and Python and R can work together. So that's what they're highlighting here, but we're going to um, Click on download at the very, very top. Let's click on download at the very top. And this brings us to the downloading page. So R studio is a company for profit, but they offer free versions. So here are the different versions you can get. We're going to go with this first one, our studio desktop. It's free. It does everything we need it to do. If you pay a thousand dollars a year, you get a com commercial license. Um, they also have a server version that can also have a license with it. We don't need any of that stuff. So we're just going to download our studio for desktop. That's free. Sarah, yeah. Sir, where was the download button? Yeah, let's it's, it was at the very top. It's really tiny on that very top line. Okay, one second. Sarah, can you see it better right here? Well, I have a split screen, so it's not showing up. Let me go to full okay. screen. It's rstudio.com. Okay. Yeah. Now I got it. Yes, thank you for stopping me. We don't want to lose anyone. Yeah. Okay, so download, and then we're going to choose the RStudio desktop free version. When you click the download, it actually, oh, it used to, Oh yeah, it actually, when you click download, it just brings you a little lower on the website. And again, you can choose the Windows version or the Mac version. They go very similarly. Now there's screenshots of all this on, in the encyclopedia. But you download whichever version is pertinent to your machine. And if you have one Windows machine and one Mac machine, that's okay. And you would just install it in the same way we installed R. Again, say yes to everything, accept all the defaults, say okay, don't change anything. <laughs> Every time someone changes something, then their computer doesn't play nice the rest of the class. Okay. I'm not gonna go through all of that. I think you guys can handle that. That's your homework is to finish installing that. We only have 10 minutes left, so I want to hit on tech. Now, tech is going to take longer to install, especially if you're on a Windows machine and especially if you have a slow connection. We're talking an hour. So 
so we're not going to be able to do it together. This is why it's like homework for next time. R and R Studio right now are great. They will do almost everything that we want to do. The reason that you need tech is to create a PDF. The process of making a PDF needs tech. Now tech or LaTeX, some people say LaTeX, is the formatting system that almost every publisher in the world uses. So, you know, you see back here, I have all these textbooks. You probably have a shelf like that wherever you are or in your office somewhere. Every book, even novels, are usually written with LaTeX. It's the way that they get the formatting consistent throughout the whole book. That the look and the, the margins and the captions and the way figures and table, everything similar through a whole book is with LaTeX formatting. Now, when I was in my master's degree, I had to learn LaTeX. And this is the helpful guide for LaTeX. It just helped you get started. Yeah, we don't want to learn this. We are not learning this. But you need the program. Our studio is going to translate to that. But we need the program. So if you're on a Mac, you need to get Mac Tech. And there is the link here in this orange box. If you keep scrolling down, there's for Windows, you need Mic Tech. There are different versions of tech software. There are other ones, but these are the two that play the best with our studio. So you'll need to go to that on Mac. Sometimes the first downloader only takes five minutes, but then the process of installation has to download more. You'll want to click where it says download Mac tech. The Mac one is fairly straightforward. Windows users. It's not as straightforward. What you need is mix tech. And here I will go to this website because I want to show you it because it's not straightforward. You mix tech, you cannot get away with the basic version. You need the full version. So you have to click on, now there is a Mac version of mix tech, but don't use it. It doesn't play nice. Mac users need Mac tech. But mix tech on the Windows users, if you just click the download here, it gets you the basic version. You don't want the basic version. You need the full version. So if you're Windows, you need to click at the top in the orange box on where it says downloads. And then, let's see, and then we need to go to all downloads tab. Okay, right here, all downloads. And do not do the basic installer. Instead, we need to choose the net installer. Now there are two net installers. One is for 64-bit, one's for 32-bit. Most of you, I think, are on 64-bit machines are pretty standard now. So you'll click on the net installer for six, and that's the one you want to download. It'll take a long time to download. Now I'm on campus, oh, this part, oh, that part, this one's quick to get the installer, but once you execute the installer, it takes a long time. That's right. I haven't done, I will tell you this. R and R Studio update those several times a year. So at the start of every semester, I update R and R Studio. LaTeX does not update. So I have not updated LaTeX on my machines for a couple years because it doesn't change. So I'll, I'll try it. It's been a while. Okay, so on Windows, I went to MicTech, I clicked on Downloads, and I did All Downloads, and then I did Net Installer and downloaded. That parts fairly quickly. That will get you, and if you can't find it, it probably goes into your Downloads file, and it will say Setup, and then a bunch of numbers and .exe. That executes the installation thing. And again, like everything, we're going to accept defaults. Yes. Okay, so this is Windows machines. You have to go through this process twice. The first time you do it, you click download and next, and it takes like an hour. Then when it's done downloading, you have to go click on this again. And then the second time you click install. 
that it's really time consuming. But the good news is you only have to do this one time ever on that computer. Okay. So like when I click on that, again, it's going to give you the option to do basic. Do we want basic? No. Oh, it, it is asking for a mirror. I'm going to just pick the closest one or the top one. Start. Yeah. This is the thing. It takes a long time. This is actually fast internet here and it still will probably take me 20, 30 minutes. Okay, questions? Hey Sarah, yeah. my R Studio, it will not download to my computer. Okay, it's we'll check that. That, um, that the OS system isn't work, it isn't, isn't the right version. Okay. We let's check yours. Anyone else having any problems? Any Can questions? You just run through the LaTeX portion with the Mac. With the Mac, yes. Let's do that. And Melissa, we'll do yours if, if we go over a few minutes. I just want to make sure everybody's questions before if they need to log off right in five minutes. So if you're on Mac, you click on this depth. So here I'll go there. So oh, I sorry, I missed how we got to this, this page. Okay, so it's in this orange box. It's tug tug dot org slash mac tech okay tug tug which i forget what that stands for dot org slash mac tech okay you you got that one yes and then it says in the middle to download click mac tech download and I'm not going to click it because I'm on Windows and it will screw it up. Right. <laughs> and then it will download your little package thing that you do the same way as we did R in our studio. Okay. And then just follow the prompts. And follow the prompts, accept all the defaults. Now, with Mac, there might be one time it asks you. Now, just like on R, we're going to download our packages. LaTeX has packages too. So the only thing you want to keep a lookout for is if during the download it asks it might ask you something about packages and it the options are do you want me to ask you every time you need a new package select no just download it without my, you know just go ahead and download it and the two different programs ask it in different ways in the windows it doesn't ask it on the download portion it asks it when you go back and install it and I'm not sure on the Mac since I can't do that on my machine. But on the Mac, when you're going through the Mac tech, keep an eye out. And if it asks you anything about packages, just tell it there's usually, I think there's two or three options. Choose the one that it just downloads it without asking you. Okay. That's the only thing that you might have to change. Okay. Other than that, go with the defaults. Okay. Melissa, I still got you. I know. Anyone else? Good. Okay. Email me directly, sarah.schwartz at usu.edu. If you have any issues, we'll set up a Zoom and just get on and check your specific computer to make sure it's working. You will know it's working if you can open our studio and um, it'll look like a blue circle with the letter R in the middle of it. And um, you see our studio. And I'm trying to open it, but my computer's not because it's still, oh, I'm done downloading. Yay. Now my R studio looks black. Yours will probably look white because I've already reset my settings. But if you can open R studio and up at the top corner, it says R studio, you know, you're good. Okay. All right, Melissa, Nobody else has any questions. I'm going to stop my screen share so that you can start yours so we can see exactly what's happening on your machine. There. So I'm not on this. Oh, machine. it's on a different machine. Okay. Do you, yeah. can you log off zoom and then put zoom on the turn on zoom on that other machine? Does it have a, even if it doesn't have a webcam? Uh, if you just so go to a browser yeah and um 
it's what is it? Zoom.us slash my slash stat studio. So class is over now, right? Class is over class now. Time. Yay. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Schwartz. Okay. Any questions, time. let me know. So you're going to be reading chapter two in discussion point, not chapter one, unless you want to, but chapter two, and then making sure your software is installed. And that's what you need to do by Wednesday. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any questions, let me know. Log off when you're ready. Yeah, thanks. Okay. See you guys. Uh, Sarah, do you mind if I stay on for just a few minutes? I have a question for you about that 60-50 um, course. Yes, definitely. Okay. In fact, Melissa, are you, is it, are you getting Zoom up on that other machine? It's launching. It's just taking okay. a minute. That's okay. Laura, did you have some questions? I just wanted to wait until the Mac Tech downloaded to make sure I did it right. Is that okay? okay? Just hold on. Yeah, just okay. hang out. Okay. Got a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the quickest thing, especially if you have a, um, not a Ethernet connection, if you're using Wi-Fi and other people are on it. Yeah, when I teach in the classroom, everyone in the classroom is trying to do it at the same time. It still bogs it down. Yeah. I think you have to let me in. Uh, oh, yes, I see. Admit. Okay, I clicked admit. Oh, here you come. Yes, we have you double. <laughs> okay, we're not hearing you. Let's see. Melissa, try going to the bottom, like hover over the pictures in the bottom left hand corner, it says mute. And even if it's unmuted, do the up arrow and do the settings and see if the settings on that other computer are set up with the mic. Okay, can you hear me now? Yay, good. Take a second. Yep. Okay, so I'll share, you ready for me to share my screen? Go for it. And again, choose the upper left hand most tile that it'll either see, say desktop or screen. So I can see, yeah. Okay. So this is what I get, so I. Okay, let me look at this. You have 10, I'm gonna write this down. Um, you have OSX 10.11.6. Okay, you can click OK on that little box in the front and go back to the page. The, um, yep. Okay, so scroll down. Yep, so see, you've got 10.11 and that says Mac 10.13. I couldn't find anything that matched my operating, operating system, system. On here. Hmm. I might have to ask Tyson about this. Tyson has a Mac. We work well together because he does Mac and I do Windows. So we usually troubleshoot each other's classes. Let's see. I'm going to Google it. Um, our studio. Wait, so what are you looking for on the screen? Melissa? I'm looking for the right operating system. This is saying that I have to have a 10.13 and I have a 10.11. Oh, oh, I think that I found one. Oh, that'd be fabulous. You're going to have to use an older version of um, RStudio because it looks like the most recent RStudio is only able to be put on 10.13. So I'm going to come over here to the chat. Okay. Can you see the chat window that I just put something in? I just put a link. The Zoom chat window. Did it come up yeah, automatically? It, yeah. Okay. So that is, um, there's a link there to older versions of um, our studio. I, you should be okay for the class. Should. Every, once in a while, yours might look a little different than mine. 
but this should work. So um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. It has the older versions there, but let's find out which version you need. What's the old? What's the newest version for ten point eleven? Okay. I don't know what this one. Yeah, OS. Here, I'm, I'm reading a discussion here. Cool. Okay. Try so scroll up to the top of this page. Um, so let's let's try the first one and we'll go down the list to find the the most recent one that will go with yours. So here on that installer, yeah, try that one. Let's see if this one will work. And if this is 1.1.463. And if this one won't work, then we'll go to the next one down the list. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's, there's always a couple of issues like this every semester. We want to get it taken care of on day one, not day seven. Fingers crossed. <laughs> That'd be great. I'm thinking you might have to go one more before this. Did you get this far last time? No. Hi, hey, so. that's good news. Yep. This is like watching water boil. I know. It's not as bad as LaTeX on a Windows download. <laughs> Especially when I, one time I did it at home and my kids were streaming a movie. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> yes, I yes. do want to open it. I know. <laughs> yes. It's always good to know your computer's watching out for you, but. <laughs> uh, I imagine something more than this is supposed to happen. Yeah, well, let's give it a little second more. Okay, go ahead and, and red X that. Okay, come over on your taskbar on the side and try clicking on the RStudio icon again. I'm not a Mac guru, so this is not. I feel like it should be showing us something else. Yeah, that doesn't look good. There's no, no error message though. So I don't know if this helps. This is what I did though. Um, I've moved the R Studio icon into applications, into the applications folder and opened it from there. I don't know if that makes a difference. The application folder that's showing right there? Yeah. 
move this over into here. Uh -huh. I don't think that should make a difference. But um, and then go, go find our studio in there. Yep. It's doing the copying. We'll see. It'd be great if it worked. And you can see a couple lines above that, there's just R, plain R. That's the one we don't touch. Oh, and it's put it down on lower on your, your task bar. I don't see what I should see. <laughs> <laughs> I see nothing. Well, I'll go through and try downloading the one just below that. Mm -hmm. See if that works. Would you email me either way, whether it works or it doesn't? Mm -hmm. So that I know that you're okay or we need to get Tyson involved. Because if we can't get this fixed quickly, I'm going to have Tyson help out. Okay, so yeah, I'll just try another one then. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your help. Absolutely. Keep in touch. Okay. I'll stop sharing.